Hello, I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. I'm here at the Interval in San Francisco, where I'll be joined remotely by our speaker today, Wade Davis. This is the second talk that Wade Davis has given in our series. The first one was on indigenous technologies and how that's useful in the modern world. And today he's gonna to be talking about the field of anthropology and where it's come from, where it's going, and really maybe how it can help the world that we're living in today. Welcome, Wade Davis. Well, thanks, Alexander, and thanks to the Long Now Foundation. It's wonderful the work you do, and it's great to be back part of, uh, part of your family. Uh, and I'd like to um, share a story with you today that may seem like a small matter, a kind of a, a tempest in an academic teapot, if you will, but it's one with significant ramifications if we are ever to truly live in a kind of pluralistic, multicultural world. Now, Ruth Benedict, the acolyte of the great Franz Boas, and in 1947, the president of the American Anthropological Association, reputedly said that the very purpose of anthropology was to make the world safe for human differences. In the immediate wake of 9-11, and I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, the American Anthropological Association actually met in the nation's capital. 4,000 anthropologists were in Washington in the wake of the biggest story of culture they or the entire country would ever face. The entire gathering earned but a mention in the Washington Post newspaper, in the gossip section, in the style section, a few lines that essentially reported that the nutcases were back in town. And it was hard to know who was more remiss, the government for failing to listen to the one profession that could have answered the question then on the lips of all Americans, why do they hate us, or the profession itself for failing to reach beyond itself to bring its considerable insights and wisdom to the attention of the nation. Perhaps fittingly, it took an outsider to remind anthropologists why anthropology matters. Charles King, a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University, begins this remarkable book of his by asking us a very, to kind of participate in a very simple thought experiment, to just envision the world as it was in the lives of our grandparents, perhaps your great-grandparents. Now think for a moment about how it was in Edwardian England or America at the time before the First World War. Race, Charles notes, was accepted as a given, a biological fact, with lineages dividing white from black that reach back through primordial time. Differences in customs and beliefs reflected differences in intelligence and destiny, with every culture finding its place on a, on a rung of an evolutionary ladder that went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London, with technological wizardry, the great achievement of the West, being the sole measure of progress and success. Sexual and behavioral characteristics were fixed. Whites were smart and industrious, and some people were barely people at all. Incredibly, as recently as 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Melbourne, Australia, as to whether or not the Aboriginal peoples of Australia were in fact human or not. Women's suffrage only came in 1919, three years after the birth of my father. Immigrants in almost all nations were seen as a threat, even by those who had only recently themselves clawed their way ashore. The poor, of course, were responsible for their own miseries. As for the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the cripples, and the mad, they were best locked away, lobotomized, or even killed to remove them from the gene pool. In the time of my grandfather, the superiority of the white male was accepted with such assurance that the concise Oxford English Dictionary published in 1911 had no entries for racism or colonialism. Interracial marriage remained illegal in much of the United States until 1967. Now, here we are two generations later and it goes without saying that no educated person would share any of these bankrupt certitudes that I've now 
listed, all of which raises a question. What was it that allowed our culture to go from zero to 60 in a generation? Now, all of those were political movements, but political movements are built fundamentally on the possibility of change. And the catalyst, as Charles King reminds us in his wonderful book, was the wisdom and scientific genius of Franz Boas and a small band of courageous scholars, Margaret Mead, Alfred Krober, Elsie Klules Parsons, Melva Herskovitz, Edward Sapir, Robert Lowry, Ruth Benedict, the incomparable Zora Neale Hurston, and many others, contrarians all, who came into his orbit destined to change the world. And we today live in the social landscape of their dreams. The scientific realization that humanity is one interconnected and undivided whole. Now, widely acknowledged as a father of American cultural anthropology, Franz Boas was the first scholar to explore in a truly open and neutral manner how human social perceptions are formed and how members of distinct societies become conditioned to see and interpret the world. Far, far ahead of his times, doing his fieldwork in the 1880s, Boaz recognized that every distinct social community was a unique facet of the human legacy and its promise. Each was a product of its own history. None existed in some absolute sense. We create our social realms, Boaz would say. Determine what we then define as being common sense, universal truths, the appropriate rules and codes of behavior. Beauty really does lie in the eye of the beholder. Manners don't make the man, men and women invent the manners. Race and gender are cultural constructs derived not from biology, but born in the realm of ideas. Now, critically, none of this implied an extreme relativism, as if every human behavior had to be accepted simply because it exists. Boaz never called for the elimination of judgment, only its suspension. So the very judgments that we're obliged to make ethically and morally as human beings may be informed ones. Now, Boas has come in for a lot of criticism in the kind of revisionist era of anthropology, and he was by no means a perfect man. As Wendy Wickwire's brilliant recent book on James Tate suggests, Boas could be petty, vainglorious, fiercely ambitious, insecure, unacknowledged, jealous, covetous, slow to share credit, both threatened by and resentful of anyone else's success. But all of that said, in 1883, he lived on Baffin Island for two 12-month periods. A participant observer in the fullest sense, completely dependent on his Inuit companions, eating what they ate, wearing what they wore, and traveling as they traveled, by dog sled and small boat. In 1898, he was one of the first to speak out against the potlatch ban in the Pacific Northwest. He spoke out from the earliest days against the residential schools, just as he spoke out in favor of the rights of the Native American church to use peyote in its sacred ceremonies. In 1911, when again, to remind you, the Oxford English Dictionary did not even have an entry for racism, Boaz wrote, there is no fundamental difference in the ways of thinking of so-called primitive and civilized man. A connection between race and personality has never been established. The concept of racial type as commonly used in the scientific literature is misleading and wrong. Achievements of races do not warrant us to assume that one race can possibly be more gifted than another. As a mentor and a teacher, he supported Zora Neale Hurston, 
a black woman in the 1920s who got her PhD by studying the richness of black folkloric culture in the American South. His support for Ella Deloria, a Dakota woman, was equally strong and exceptional. As for colonialism and the treatment of Native people, he wrote in 1919, any policy that increases production of valuable raw products by exploitation of the country that destroys the social life of the natives must be condemned. It is obvious that fair and decent policies will never be introduced so long as colonies and their inhabitants are considered property of colonial powers that exploit the land and utilize their inhabitants only for their own economic purposes and for fighting their battles. Now this at a time when Teddy Roosevelt, revered today in the American conservation movement, was dismissing Native Americans as, quote, a pestilence to be removed from the body of America. Inspired by his time amongst the Inuit on Baffin Island and his later work amongst the Kwakwakawak in the salmon forests of the Pacific Northwest, he informed all who would listen that the other peoples of the world were not failed attempts to be them, failed attempts to be modern. Now here's the amazing part. Franz Boas would not live to see his insights and intuitions confirmed by hard science, let alone define the zeitgeist of a new global culture. In many ways, his intuition about cultural relativism was just a, a poetic flourish, a thought, a hope, a dream, a prayer for the well-being of humanity. But today, 80 years on, and long after his death, studies of the human genome have indeed revealed that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race has been exposed as an utter fiction. But here is the really extraordinary idea, and this is what he understood in his heart and his soul and in his mind. If we are all cut from the same fabric of life, then by definition, all peoples, all cultures share the same mental acuity, the same raw genius. And whether that intellectual potential is exercised through technological innovation, as has been the great achievement of the West, or through the untangling of the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and orientation, adaptive insights and cultural emphasis. There is no hierarchy of progress in the history of culture no evolutionary ladder to success. Boaz and his students were right. The brilliance of scientific research, the revelations of modern genetics, has affirmed in an astonishing way both the unity of humanity and the essential wisdom of cultural relativism. Every culture really does have something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. But what does this actually mean for us? How, do, how, how can we see this become expressed in studies of culture? Well, let's slip now into the culture sphere that is most antithetical to that of the West. We find ourselves in the great civilization of Australia. We know from studies of the Y chromosome that the ancestors of the Australian Aborigines were the very first human people to walk out of Africa. And in 10,000 years, they established 10,000 clan territories, all linked by a single idea, and that is a dreaming, the song lines. Now, the dreaming wasn't a dream. It was the idea that the earth both exists and is waiting to be formed. Now, when the British washed ashore on that distant continent in the late 18th century, they met a people that looked strange, who had a simple material technology, but what really offended the British was that nowhere where they went, in no tribal society of Australia, did they ever encounter anybody who had any interest whatsoever in improving upon their material lot. The British took great offense, and in their inimical way, decided that the Aboriginal people weren't people at all. And indeed, they began to shoot them. And as I said earlier, in 1902, it was debated in Parliament as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human. In the 1950s, Ranchers in Australia had 
had um, a quotas as, of, as to how many abos could be shot who trespassed upon their lands. As recently as 1960s, when I was a schoolboy, a book used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, included the Aborigines as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife in the continent. What was actually going on was a devotional philosophy too subtle for the British to understand, and that was the dreaming. And the whole point of the dreaming was the antithesis of progress. It was stasis. It was constancy. The entire idea was to not change anything, but rather to do the ritual gestures along the song line, which is a trajectory walked at the dawn of time by the ancestral beings who sang the universe into existence, and to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. And now the issue is not to say who's right and who's wrong. Had humanity as a whole followed that intellectual devotion, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biophysical uh, and biological support systems of the ent entire planet. So this is what the anthropological lens can, can show us. Let's slip for a moment into the greatest culture seer ever brought into being by the human imagination, and that, of course, is Polynesia, tens of thousands of islands flung upon the southern seas. Ten centuries before Christ, long before European transports had the nerve to sail away from the shores of continents, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. And just using celestial navigation, the signs and symbols and messages of nature, they settled the greatest culture sphere on the planet, such that you could say today that every a thing of the human genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon, if you applied that to the oceans, what you would get is Polynesia. And how about our relationship to the planet itself? You know, climate change has become humanity's problem. It wasn't caused by humanity. It was caused by a narrow subset of humanity that for 300 years has been consuming the ancient sunlight of the world. You know, all cultures are myopic faithful to their own interpretation of reality. And we too are products of our own history and culture. When in the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment, we tried desperately to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith. When Descartes famously said that all that existed is mind and material. With a single gesture, he deanimated the world and flung out all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, and metaphor to the extent that Saul Bellow would write, science made a house cleaning of belief. And the earth began to be seen as just a stage set upon which only the human drama unfolded. We developed a kind of an extractive model whereby if the flight of a bird had no meaning, a mountain was mere material and rock ready to be mined. Most peoples around the world have established relationships with the natural world based not on extractive principles, but on reciprocity. Some kind of iteration of the fundamental idea that the earth owes its bounty to people, people in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. And that simple equation elaborated through ritual and belief has a profound consequence in terms of the ecological footprint of a people. I, like many of you, was raised to believe that a mountain existed of rock ready to be mined, that a forest was cellulose ready to be cut. The point is, it's not whether a mountain is rock or is a spirit, it's how the metaphor plays out in the relationship between human beings and the natural world. Most societies around the world see the earth as alive. They see it as a force to be engaged and, and filtered through the human imagination. And all of this was made possible because Boaz and his cadre came along to shatter the conventions of European conceit. It was a shattering of the European mind, the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And though remembered today, at least by those of us who revere them, as the giants of the discipline, Boaz and his students, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, all of them, Zora Neale Hurston, were in their time dismissed from jobs because of their activism, denied promotion because of their beliefs, harassed by the FBI as the subversives they truly were, and attacked in the press simply for being different. And yet, they stood their ground. He would never sit back in silence as fully half the languages of the world 
hover on the brink of extinction, implying the loss in a single generation of fully half of humanity's social, ecological, and spiritual knowledge. To those who suggest that indigenous people are destined to fade away, he would reply that change in technology is no threat to culture, but power is. Cultures under threat are neither fragile nor vestigial. In every instance, they are living dynamic peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. That, for him, was an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be, and must be, the facilitators of cultural survival. So anthropology matters, as it always has, because it allows us to look under the surface of things. The very existence of other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other visions of life itself puts the lie to those of us in our own culture who say, for example, that we cannot change as we surely know we must, the fundamental way in which we inhabit this planet. And as the events of the last years have shown, the struggle long ago championed by Franz Boas is lamentably ongoing. Never, never has the voice of anthropology been more important. But it must be spoken to be heard. So why isn't it being heard? Well, I deliberately moved away from the academic life in 1986, soon after receiving my own uh, PhD, and only returned to the academic fold when offered, quite unexpectedly, a university tenured professorship in 2013, when I was 59 years old. And I don't know what happened, but all I can report is that in that time, anthropology turned inward, largely abandoning its roots in activism. After three decades of what I can only call flagellation and almost nihilistic self-absorption, an outsider could be forgiven for thinking that contemporary anthropologists mostly study themselves. Now, certainly in the beginning, as all disciplines do, there was reasons for critiques, reasons to rethink uh, the history and plenty to criticize in the history of anthropology. Hovering, of course, over British and French social anthropology in particular was always the shadows of a colonial past. You know, men in pith helmets literally dispatched to understand and interpret the ways of people that had come under the rule of colonial authorities. And of course, there was also in many of these classic situations of a foreign scholar and a local people, a kind of power dynamic um, that could be manipulated. And I can only say that if someone turned up at my house here on this small island, British Columbia, and announced that I was going to house and feed them for a year and they were here to study my private life, I'd call the police. And so perhaps it was an inv inevitable that, as in the way of scholarship, a new generation of scholars would come to question the certitudes of a previous generation. But it seems to me that it, in anthropology, it became too much. Things got out of hand. The baby was tossed out with the bathwater. Legitimate concerns and critiques tumbled one upon the other until the very rationale of the discipline was being called into question, cannibalized by revisionist contempt for its elders, reduced to the intellectual equivalent of the circular firing squad. My experience in anthropology as a storyteller traveling the world was very different. When I applied to the NSF for grants to study the secret societies at the time notorious in the literature, I received the money, but it was annotated on my academic grant application that if I tried to do this work, I would be killed. I never felt for a moment that was the case. But the point is, even if it had been the case, it wouldn't have made a difference because the mission was more important at that time than any particular challenges faced by the individual scholar. So for me, anthropology has always been about activism. Here's a world where people die. For years, working with the Penan to help protect the forests of Sarawak in the face of the greatest and most intense industrial deforestation ever to occur in the world. And Bruno Manzer, our dear friend and comrade, murdered by the Chinese loggers. And yet Ian McKenzie, 
my close friend with whom I wrote a book, a linguist who has devoted himself to that people, that language, and every year since 1993 has returned to spend six months in the forest to chronicle that tongue, that language, that wisdom, that tradition. Or my friend Adalberto Villafania, a leader of the Arawakos, murdered by the Paracos in Colombia, and yet today his son is the leader of the Arawako nation. Tibetan scholar I traveled 6,000 kilometers with from Chengdu to Lhasa, and only when we reached the ancient Tibetan t capital did I learn the story of his family, his father murdered by the Red Guard when the Maoists took over Lhasa in 1959, his uncle escorting His Holiness to freedom in Nepal, his mother imprisoned for the sin of being wealthy, he as a little boy smuggled into the prison where he spent months beneath her dress, hidden away because she needed to be with him. And the sister who did that brave deed put into a Maoist concentration camp during the Cultural Revolution, and she stepped inadvertently one day on a Maoist armband that had slipped off the sleeve of an adjacent worker, and for that transgression was given seven years of hard labor. This is the real front lines of anthropology. My friend Martin Hildebrand, to whom I dedicate my most recent book, Martin, a young student of anthropology, paddles down the Pitta Parana after he graduates in the 1960s. He come upon the hut where he finds an old man still paying off the cost of a treadle sewing machine 50 years after it was bartered to him by a rubber baron. He immediately stops, establishes a rubber company that will give the indigenous people fair and just Pr uh, prices for their product. He studies the Tan Tanimuko language. He becomes one as a Tanimuko, and then he does his PhD, and then he becomes head of Indian Affairs. And in 1985, the president of Colombia, Vigilio Barco, says to Martin, Martin, do something for the Indians. And in five incredible years, Martin does more than something. He secures legal land tenure for an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon, land rights encoded in perpetuity in the 1991 constitution of the country, and then behind a veil of isolation created by the conflict of modern Colombia, a whole new dream of culture is born. Stephen Hugh Jones, who lived with the Barasana and his wife Christine in 1968, who revealed their world to us, a world that we would not know of, a world in which the most profound Spiritual intuition is the idea that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. A, a, a realm of mythology that is a land management plan that dictates precisely how people can live with doing no harm to the forest. He was one of the anthropologists who predicted the disappearance of the Barasana, lamentably, in 1968. And he flies back in to join us in a film project. He walks into a longhouse, sees 250 men in full ritual regalia celebrating the fertility of cassava woman. He can't believe his eyes and he gets on the satellite phone to his wife, Christine, back in London. And he says, I can't believe it. The only thing that disappeared, my love, are the fucking missionaries. And so what happened is that politics changed. The land went back. And when we asked some elders why they uh, accepted the, um, the presence of these missionaries for so long who were doing so much harm, they said something very meaningful and profound. Why did we accept them? Because they promised to make us human. And that is the essence of, of colonialism, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. And that is a cycle that the anthropologists broke and helped to break. And Martin has stood as a companion, a comrade, a brother of all the peoples of Northwest Amazon. So if we move to the Arctic and the legendary Newt Rasmussen, a son of a Danish missionary and mother of Inuit blood, who moved effortlessly between the social and cultural realms. He knew the language from birth. He ran his own dogs at the age of nine. From an outpost in northern Greenland, he launched seven research expeditions between 1912 and 1933 that explored the length of Greenland and on the greatest of all crossed all of North America 20,000 miles to Point Barrow, Alaska, an expedition unparalleled since that of Lewis and Clark. Now he didn't take these journeys with endurance records in mind. He had no interest in being the first to do anything. His ambitions had nothing to do with self. Travel allowed him to enter the Inuit world through the only portal then available to him, shared experience on the open tundra.
His holy grail was not a place, an object, but a state of mind, a depth of understanding that would allow him to reveal to the world the wonder of Inuit life. Stretching across all the circumpolar expanses, a common culture of the northern ice, people speaking dialects of the same language, sharing beliefs and myths, responding to the same adaptive imperatives. Only one who had physically crossed on foot from Greenland to Alaska could report as he did that a youth in Greenland would recognize a tale told by a grandfather on the northern slope of Alaska, just as an elder there would know the folklore of the polar Eskimo of northwest Greenland. And though a child of the Arctic and adopted son of the Inuit, Rasmussen never abandoned his obligations as a scholar. The research expedition of the Fifth Thule, published in 1946, fills 10 volumes, 6,000 pages, 20,000 artifacts. This extraordinary source that today is the invaluable portrait of the Inuit before sustained and corrosive contact began in the 1950s. And with his wizardly gift for languages and his well-honed ethnographic eye, Rasmussen never doubted that the true glory of the Arctic resided not in the landscape, not in this meaningless point called the North Pole, but in the genius and the vision of the Inuit. His life mission was to know the world as they did, to understand the patterns of their lives, to enter their realms of magic and shamanic power. With knowledge as his goal, cultural understanding the quest, Rasmussen completely redefined the promise and potential of exploration, not to mention ethnography. The point is that anthropology exists not to tear people apart, but to bring them together. It's not about the traditional versus the modern. It's, it's about the rights of free people everywhere to choose the components of their lives. It's certainly not about freezing people in time like some kind of zoological specimen as if they're frozen in the past. It's about asking ourselves what kind of world do we all want to live in? How can we all find a way that all peoples everywhere benefit from the genius of science and modernity but without that engagement demanding the death of who they are as a people? And the reason for this is clear. It's not an issue of nostalgia romance, even human rights. It's about geopolitical stability, because culture is not trivial. Culture is not superficial. Culture is not the songs we sing, the prayers we utter, the clothes we wear, the dances we do. Culture ultimately is a body of ethical and moral values that every culture places around each individual within that culture to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history sadly teaches us lies within all human beings. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe, to do as Lincoln said in his first inaugural address, to seek the better angels always of our nature. And what happens when culture is lost, when the constraints of morality and ethics flounder and are torn apart? What happens is what happens all around us, just take a look around. As human beings, either through volition or coercion, are torn from constraints and the comfort of their past, as they find themselves on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere, in a sea of alienation and disaffection, out of that comes all the points of crisis around the world. So the fight for the integrity of culture is not a rhetorical fight. It's a real battle, and we have to fight, and people will die. It's not about the twiddling of thumbs. And I want to remind everybody that we're in this together. No one has a monopoly on suffering. But the bottom line is this. We still live in a world of conflict. And when we live in a world where the people in Gaza are being bombarded by the day, live in a world where a million Uyghurs are in Chinese prison camps and concentration camps, where the forest of the Penan has been laid waste and with it a whole way of life morally inspired, inherently right, with an extraordinary knowledge of that forest has been swept away in a single generation. Anthropology must retake the challenges of our time. It has to take on the, 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 the mission of Boaz and his people. We must be the, 
that the activist warriors who stand up for the integrity of all peoples, of all cultural expressions, of every point of wonder of the human imagination to be found in all parts of the world. And now's the time to do it. A time when the languages are being lost, the forests are being cut, the systems of life themselves compromised. It is only humanity that can find its way out to a brighter day. Well, thank you so much, Wade. That was really great. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, to invite you on for some Q&A. Welcome, Wade Davis. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we're, rec we're pre-recording some of this Q&A because you, you might be heading off on, uh, on another expedition. Is that right? Yeah, I just don't know where I'm going to be on June 29th. You know, I mean, we've been um, kind of, uh, hell, in Canada, we've been very restricted. Uh, I haven't left this little island virtually, uh, except to go skiing a few times uh, since the COVID thing struck. This talk is really important to me because I, I actually, um, you know, my mother was an anthropologist and, um, and I got into design kind of as, in a way, as, as a way of kind of doing anthropology. And, and, um, and what was very frustrating to me is I went, on, I went to a university so I could take university classes along with design classes. And then when I took anthropology, it was all about self-reflection of the field rather than the work. And so, and so I basically just didn't do it and it was very frustrating. And so this, is, this really resonates with me. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there a generation of either explorers or storytellers or, or even anthropologists, grad students that are willing to go to the field? Or are you seeing that's just drying no, up? No, absolutely. But, they, but, but they're, you know, in many cases, their work is not being supported by the, by the funding agencies that are controlled by this orthodoxy. Um, right. uh, you know, there, there's never been more uh, a, a stronger cadre of imaginative explorers than the millennial generation. I mean, you know, part of this for me is that when I, uh, you know, turned my back on academic life, it didn't mean that I stopped being an academic. Every one of my books, I've written 23, is a PhD. For my book on Everest, I bought 600 books, visited 57 archives, you know, um, made three field expeditions to the flanks of Everest and, and, and spent months in monasteries. The point is you continue to do the ethnographic work. It's just that you publish in uh, outlets that, um, that um, um, are accessible to people and meaningful to people. Look, we live, we live in a time where, according to a study of Derek Bach, uh, fully 98% of academic papers in the humanities and 75% in the social sciences are never cited again never cited once. Well, that's a measure of their relevance. Um, right. You know, we, we, we live in a world where at a major university, like University of British Columbia, where I'm on the faculty, uh, something on the order of 70% of our successful PhDs do not get academic jobs. And yet the pedagogy is still based on a calcified 1960s model that said that if you got a PhD, you became a professor. And so what have we done? The number of PhDs being produced is soaring, the number of tenured positions is dropping, and the number of sessional employees, uh, in some cases, poor men and women living in the backs of cars, uh, you know, being paid pittances to do coursework for uh, classes full of students whose parents are paying huge amounts of money in tuition uh, to support that university. We watch at universities where the, the, the percentage of the budget committed to administration is soaring, whereas that pedagogy and teaching is declining. You see that these universities are frankly working their way out of relevance. And I mean, you touched on this a little bit is that, you know, this, this massive wild kind of human experiment that we're in the middle of right now, COVID. And I'd love to just get, you, you touched on it in your essay, but you know, what is anthropology, where does it fit into uh, an amazing kind of time that we are in? Uh, amazing in the sense it's kind of horrible, but amazing. In Never in history has the entire world focused on the same problem. You know, a pathogen 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt, which not only commandeer our biology, but attack the network of community and, con and connectivity that is for a, a social species what teeth and claws represent to the tiger. You know, we, we saw the world shut down. And, but also in that vision, we saw what the world is. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about COVID is that we saw the resilience of the earth. 
you know, overnight the sky's clearing over Kathmandu and Delhi and Mumbai for the first time in a generation. Wild boar in the streets of um, of um, of Barcelona, wolves and grizzlies in the floor of Yosemite, uh, the canals of uh, Venice clear, rivers in Colombia running like brook streams. You know, it, 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 I found that really inspiring and, and humbling. And also it showed the impact of human activities on the earth, of course. But, you know, it's, it's humbling to remember, um, Xander, that if you took the entire a hominid presence on earth, I don't just mean Homo sapiens and going back to our immediate progenitor Homo erectus, but all the way back to Homo arfarensis, which is somewhere 2.3 million years ago. And you take that entire timeline and put it on a 24-hour clock of the history of the earth, the entire hominid presence would not occupy a second. So in other words, you know, the weed will win in the end, as that great Sierra Club book said. The question is, will we leave to our descendants an earth that we can be proud of? And I think COVID, uh, you know, many things will change uh, coming out of COVID. Now, I think we've discovered that, that people can work in a digital age at home, not all peoples and certainly not people who have to scramble for a living every day on the streets of cities like Medellin and Lima and Mumbai. But certainly a number of us can. And I think we can look back also um, at the frenet frenetic travel schedules that we all once had as a kind of violent hallucination. Uh, I never want to have to travel like that again. It doesn't mean I won't yeah. travel for purpose and for, 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 for meaningful experiences. And I hope we all do more of that. But that image we all have of Chicago's O'Hare Airport on Monday afternoon, like ants in a b ant nest, right? You know, I think some of that's got to, I mean, what manager can rationalize the expense of flying in the executive team to San Francisco and put, putting them up in the W Hotel and all that right. kind of racket, you know? <laughs> so I think, yeah. I think, I think. Or people getting flown around the world for a 45 minute talk. Well, that's right. And that's what I used to do. I'd fly off to <laughs> Cleveland to the ball bearing manufacturers associated. And yeah. now, of course, I mean, I, I, I've found that this new world of Zoom I, I, is, has been so liberating for me. Now, I don't want to under, in any way, under um, um, uh, state the, the, the sadness and the misery we feel for those who have suffered, not just who have lost loved ones, but the economic dislocations. I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to be in a place where I didn't have economic pressures. I, uh, I, I live in a place that's beautiful and bucolic, and it was a pleasant place to sit out the pandemic. So I, I'm not trying to um, say that, 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 that I wasn't a, very much a person of privilege in that. Um, but at, at, at the same time, I remember I woke up one morning and uh, I edited in, uh, with that, uh, that Rolling Stone piece, edited another piece I was doing for a publisher in Toronto, uh, uh, participated in the Sonoma Writers Festival, a wonderful festival that I didn't have to go to. I could just, you know, and that had 4,000 people instead of 400 people. Uh, then I administered an exam to a kid in Singapore, got it back, graded it, put it into the registrar at the university, looked at my watch, Xander, it was 11 o'clock, and I went out and planted a fruit orchard. You know, I mean, like, I think I think we can find ways to, in, 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 I, hope, I hope we'll learn from um, our, 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 our year of, of, of quietude. And I want to come back to this thing that you mentioned in the, in your talk, this kind of nexus of where, um, where, Kind of cultural and linguistic loss uh, is often a precursor to massive environmental loss, and and I think you know there's this as you were mentioning as we lose language after language, um, and we lose the word the indigenous people lose the words for the things around them. That also seems to presage them losing the care for a lot of the things around them and moving away from their 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 you know, ancestral areas. Um, and so I think this is a, you know, it's rare that you have a signal where you can get a 20 year head start knowing that the environmental loss is gonna happen in a place. And that's one of the kind of signals that we, that, that this kind of information gives us, but we don't seem to be acting on it in a very good way. People are recognizing that much of the, at least terrestrial uh, extent biodiversity, pristine lands is at least titularly under the control of indigenous people. And so, for example, my uh, my good friend Pete Seligman, who created Conservation International, now is with the support of the Emerson Collective. He's got a new organization, Neotero, which is trying to work directly with Indigenous people to, um, as colleagues to empower them uh, to be stronger uh, and more forceful and more uh, empowered advocates 
of their own homelands. And that, that kind of combination of uh, 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 environmental vision, uh, of which Pete personifies, uh, particularly in the tropics, with the, 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 the support for indigenous people was almost unimaginable in the year, for example, when Pete um, and Russ Mittemeyer and, uh, um, and uh, you know, others came together to create CI. So I think that's all very positive. And, um, you know, again, indigenous people, uh, uh, you know, when it, it's a little bit like the environment. You know, I think we're, we're impatient with the pace of social change. But, you know, when I was a kid, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was an environmental victory. Nobody spoke about the biosphere. Now that term is part of the vernacular of school children. And by the same token, when I first went to Colombia in 1974, for example, and I'd say to my my friends, the parents of my friends in particular at the uh, the Nacional, the university, that I was going to live with the Arawakos in the Sierra Nevada, they would say to me, you know, ¿Por qué quiere vivir con la gente sucia? Why do you want to live with the dirty people? Well, there have now been five Colombian presidents whose first act of office, even before their inauguration, has been to go to the Sierra to pay homage to the Mamos who have emerged kind of, of symbols of continuity and, and hope in a country that's been torn by the drug wars. Uh, so, so, you know, it, 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 it's, the, there's much progress to be made, but we've come, in a sense, a, a very long way. And it's an ongoing, again, as I said earlier, there's not a clear victory line or a, an ending line. It's just a process we have to continue to do. Um, the idea that nations in Canada treat nation to nation with the federal government would have been unimaginable in the lifetime of my grandfather. But now it's something that not, as only, not only occurs, it's broadly supported by, by the Canadian people. And we're proud of it. Well, and we're, we're going to wrap up here a little bit. I just wanted to um, get a sense of, you know, what's, what is next for you as the, as the pandemic lifts? Um, do you, I know your, your most recent book was uh, just out uh, in this fall about uh, River in Colombia. And what's your, what's your next project? Well, my, my, my real devotion is to Colombia, where I was made an honorary uh, citizen by um, the Nobel laureate Juan Manuel Santos, who's become a good friend. Um, you know, the book I wrote, Magdalena, River of Dreams, is really an attempt to write a biography of a country through the metaphor of its, its Mississippi, if you will, the Magdalena, the river of life, the river that made possible the country. Columbia is a gift of the river. And um, the book was conceived in a moment of great optimism, in a sense, written over five years, um, sparked in part. Um, I was there during the, the uh, historic signing of the peace agreement. And it's be and because of the success of other books that I've had, my the book El Rio, for example, which um, was published uh, in Colombia in 2002, a low point in the country's fortunes, um, and it became not just a, a hit book, but a kind of a map of dreams for generations of kids who couldn't travel within their own, their own country. And it was embraced by all sides of the Colombian spectrum, old and young, left and right. And it was actually named by the Biblioteca Nacional as one of the first 25 of what will be the top 200 books in the history of the country, which was a singular kind of honor. And because of that book and films I've done, positions I've had, speeches I've given, the new book, um, I have a, a, a voice in Colombia that is, is something that I have to use effectively and, and, and uh, uh, humbly. Uh, and now... My question is how to use it in the wake of these the recent disturbances that um, have racked the country. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very sad situation that I think the world needs to understand. I mean, let's just remember that 260,000 dead, uh, 100,000 missing, seven million internally displaced, five million forced to flee. How would the United States feel if Canada had patterns of drug consumption laws that did nothing to limit the trade, but uh, but but empowered the cartels such that 85 million Americans would be forced from their homes. Well, that's what happened in Colombia. And yet during all those terrible years of a war that not would not have lasted a day without the cocaine money. Uh, last year of war, incidentally, the FARC made $600 million from kidnapping, extortion, and drug trafficking. Give me the Boy Scouts of San Francisco, of Marin County, and $600 million, I can create havoc in Northern California. 
uh, and and uh, um, during all those years, Colombia maintained civil society, democracy, greened its cities, uh, sought restitution with indigenous people, as I've mentioned, created millions of acres of national parks, and paved the way for a cultural economic renaissance as two generations of kids forced to flee are coming home with skill sets and everywhere. But here's where things went wrong. Santos negotiated the peace agreement. The peace agreement had clauses that would cost $45 billion, mostly about social development, infrastructure development. Then into office came Duque, a protege of Alvaro Uribe, who ran against the agreement. And if he didn't actively dismantle it, he certainly did little to implement it. And he didn't have the gravitas himself that a Santos who had just electrified the world by winning the Peace Prize would have had, say he had had a few extra years in office. And because of that, into the void created by the retreat of the FARC and the failure of the federal state to enter, entered into that area, um, dissidents, um, cartels. Remember, we've continued, you know, until we do the cleansing stroke of legalization, cocaine will be the curse of Colombia. The rivers of blood will still flow because of cocaine. And then, and then on top of everything, uh, faced with the expenses of implementing the accord, the price of oil collapsed, Colombia's main source of foreign revenue, and then Colombia did something it hasn't gotten credit for. It. Uh, the biggest humanitarian crisis in the history of the Americas had two million Venezuelans come into Colombia, and they weren't rejected at the border as America rejects people from Central America. They were welcomed, housed, fed, schooled, given health care, and given permission to work. And then comes COVID. The economic collapse, the, the social collapse, poverty rates increase after having gone down for years, and, there, and then comes together a kind of a perfect storm. Uh, you know, a, an ill-conceived uh, tax proposed that's gonna, uh, that, that, that people just don't want to hear about in their time of economic need and misery. Uh, various um, uh, students, students with their grievances, indigenous people with their grievances, you know, and, and again, it's like Black Lives Matter. It explodes for uh, in the streets. It doesn't necessarily mean that America should be measured exclusively by what happened in the summer of Black Lives Matter. For all that we need to recall and acknowledge that wonderful phrase, um, but 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 so what's happening now is sort of this perfect storm. And then it's been accentuated by some police brutality and um, 40 or 50 at least people have been shot unnecessarily, mostly young kids. And again, what we forget is that the police part of the Department of Defense, they're all coming out of a 50 year conflict where Escobar in the very beginning made murder and death cheap, right? So, you know, I'm not saying that the police uh, should, be, uh, should be forgiven on the contrary. But, but you know, you're, you're, you're talking about security forces that have been living through all their lives a world of violence, of a three-sided war uh, that saw 260,000 people killed, all because of North American and European consumption of cocaine, I might add. Right. And so, so it's just broken like a, a storm. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it's not going to put Colombia back to where it was. Peace will never disappear. The people are too hungry for it. And there is a middle way in Colombia. Uh, and, and that middle way is what I represent. And it's a place that I want to speak from. And so my biggest effort in the next months will be doing everything I can for Colombia and the peace process. Well, thank you so much for this talk. And thank you so much for joining us. And um, can't wait to hear how it goes in the coming months in, in Colombia. I hope you're able to get back soon. Thanks very much, Xander. And I want to thank you, our audience, with Long Now. Um, we look forward to having you at our future talks. Thank you.